Um, okay, so today we are uh, truly delighted to have Yonit Hochberg here, uh, all the way from Israel. Um, Yonit received her bachelor's degree in 2005 from the Technion Institute in Israel, and then received her PhD in 2013 from the Weizmann Institute. Um, she went on to do postdocs at UC Berkeley and Cornell, and then became faculty at Hebrew University of Jerusalem at the Raqqa Institute for Physics in 2017. Um, she has received a number of honors and awards, including being elected a member of the Israel Young Academy of Science. Uh, she's received the Bekenstein Prize of the Israel Physics Society and the Krill Prize of the Wolf Foundation. Um, she's had an exciting career doing research in theoretical particle physics, as well as dark matter. Um, and her research has sort of started out by looking at various supersymmetric extensions of the standard model. Um, she did a lot of exciting work thinking about new physics interpretations of the top forward backward asymmetry, um, as well as looking at various extensions of the Higgs boson sector, sector and electroweak symmetry breaking. Uh, more recently, her focus has been on uh, models of dark matter and also um, she's had a lot of exciting new ideas for new methods of detecting uh, dark matter. So I think we might hear about some of that today. So take it away. Okay, thanks so much. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Um, so hi everyone, it's really nice to meet you. Um, and I wanna thank the organizers for, uh, for inviting me. Um, and of course, I wish that we could be meeting uh, actually live in person, um, but I'm very grateful for this virtual opportunity. Um, and of course, I hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy in these crazy times. Um, so as, a, as David said, I'm a, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is um, a topic that I've been really excited uh, over the last few years about, and that's new directions for light dark matter. Um, as you also said, I'm a theoretical particle physicist um, and I work on dark matter. And what I kind of hope to convey to you um, today is that even if you've never thought of yourself as somebody who works on dark matter or has any relationship with dark matter, um, I really hope to convince you that maybe you could actually be working on dark matter too. So the outline of my talk is very simple. I'm gonna start by telling you why I think light dark matter is interesting. And then we'll talk about how we can hope to explore it. And we're gonna talk about this both from the purely theory side as well as the experimental side. So let's start at the beginning. Um, as a physicist, I'm sure uh, we're all curious people. And so you've probably looked out to the sky and asked yourself at least some point in your lifetime, uh, what's out there? And in particular, how much stuff is out there? And we can, of course, try to answer this question in uh, many different ways. You know, one way is we can just look, of course, not with our naked eyes, we use very fancy telescopes for this, and we can see stars and dust, and we can estimate how much stuff is there. But of course, another way that we can try to assess how much is there is by looking at, for instance, the motion of stars, because the motion of stars is affected by the force of gravity that they're feeling. Gravity, of course, cares about how much stuff is there. And so if we look at these two methods, just looking versus, uh, versus what we see in terms of um, um, uh, seeing versus, excuse me, what we feel, the force of gravity, we find something very curious, and that is that what we see is very different from what we feel. And so uh, since first being postulated in the 1930s, uh, we now have accumulating indirect evidence for the existence of dark matter. So we see it in rotation curves of galaxies where we know that something is out there permeating the galaxy, extending to its halo. We know that something is out there bending and twisting light, making uh, groups of galaxies seem like funny creatures from, uh, from Alice in Wonderland. So this is, for instance, the Cheshire Cat group. We see it in colliding clusters like the Bullet Cluster, where there's a clear offset between the gravitational system, the gravitational center of the system that's indicated in blue compared to the uh, visible, visible center that's indicated by red. And nowadays, we also have incredibly accurate measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And all of these point to the same picture that something is pulling on us and we can't see it. And so our universe is dark. In fact, nearly 30% of the energy content of our universe is in the form of dark matter. If we look at our beautiful standard model of particle physics, which it, with its um, uh, fundamental constituents, there's simply no candidate that can do the job. And this means that there has to be physics uh, strictly beyond the standard model. There has to be at least one new particle that should exist in our universe today. 
And what we want to understand is what is this particle or particles and how does it interact with itself and with uh, ordinary matter? And so here are a few things that we know about dark matter. We know how much we have. So we know that there's around five times the mass density in dark matter compared to what sits in baryons. And what that roughly means is that if the mass of the dark matter is say of order the mass of the proton of order a GV, then there's roughly you know, one dark matter particle in your cup of coffee. We also know that dark matter is massive, but we have absolutely no idea what its mass actually is. Um, we know that if at all, it shouldn't interact too strongly with known forces such as quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics because these uh, types of interactions would mean that we would already have detected it. And we also know that dark matter shouldn't interact too strongly with itself because strong self interactions will distort dynamics in dark matter halos. And so the picture that you should kind of keep in mind as we're walking through our talk together is, um, you know, we're sitting here on planet Earth, which is, of course, um, um, you know, kind of think of our galaxy as sort of uh, this flat, uh, this flat disk, and we're rotating. So, kind of, um, I like to think of this as like a rotating pizza. Okay, and all around us, there's this big poofy halo of dark matter. So, kind of think of it as this big falafel ball of dark matter, and we're sort of a rotating pizza um, inside of that. Okay, and so there's also a relative velocity if we're rotating between us and the dark matter. There's always a dark matter wind that's hitting us, um, and it's of order ten to the minus three uh, the speed of light in terms of its velocity. Now, it's no secret, I think, that the star of the show for the past 40 years has been the WIMP, the glorious WIMP, with, of course, appropriately stated caveats about axions. And the idea is extremely simple. Um, and it goes back to actually 1977, where Leon Weinberg shows that it's possible to link dark matter with early universe cosmology. And so imagine if you have some new particle that has two to two interactions with ordinary matter with the standard model particles, there could be some relative density that's left over. And so in the early universe, there are sort of two processes that are relevant. We have the forward um, annihilation process where dark matter annihilates, as well as the back reaction where dark matter is produced. And uh, the early universe, uh, both in the early universe, both of these processes are sort of rapidly occurring and the sectors equate. But as our universe is expanding and cooling, at some point, these sectors depart from uh, thermal contact. And we can go ahead and write down the Boltzmann equation that describes the evolution over time over temperature of the number density of dark matter. And so, of course, the change in the number density cares about the fact that our universe is expanding. Um, and we take into account both the forward annihilation process as well as the back reaction of producing dark matter particles times the strength of the interaction. And we can go ahead and solve this equation to understand how the number density is changing. And when you do this, you find that at very early times or at very high temperatures, both of these processes are rapidly occurring. But then as the universe is cooling, at some point the temperature drops beneath the mass of the dark matter particle. And at that point, it becomes very difficult to produce them. And you can kind of think of it that this production process essentially shuts off. And then dark matter is just rapidly annihilating away. But it doesn't annihilate away completely because as the universe is cooling, it's also expanding. And so these particles are becoming more and more dilute until at some point the dark matter particles have become so dilute that they can no longer find each other in order to annihilate. And that's the point at which we're left with a constant amount of dark matter. And of course, how much dark matter we're left with depends on the strength of this interaction. So uh, depending on the size of this cross section, we'll be left with uh, a different amount of dark matter, but for just the right size of this cross section, we'll be left with just the right amount of dark matter. And this is the standard picture of what we call dark matter freeze out. And we can parameterize this, uh, this uh, ordinary two to two annihilation cross section by you know, some coupling squared over uh, mass squared. And what you find is that, as we said, there's a particular size for this cross section such that we've accounted for what we observe. Um, but said another way, there's a particular relationship between that mass and the coupling, which says that the mass of the dark matter should be of order the coupling times around 30 TV. And so it happens to be this, the case that if this coupling is of order an electroweak coupling of order 10 to the minus two, then the electroweak scale emerges. And so this is uh, aptly uh, called weakly interacting massive particle, or in short, the WIMP miracle. And this WIMP miracle has been our dominant notion for dark matter for nearly 40 years. And it's easy to understand why, right? Because it's extremely simple and it's extremely predictive. And as this has been our dominant notion for dark matter for so many years, it's also been guiding our experimental searches. And we search for dark matter in a variety of different ways. 
Uh, one way is to search at colliders, where we smash standard model particles on each other, such as protons, uh, hoping to produce dark matter particles that we'll be able to somehow detect. And this is, of course, what we do, for instance, at the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. We also search via targets that sit in the lab, typically deep underground, where we take some big pool of standard model particles that we understand, typically heavy nuclei, and uh, put them in this uh, in our laboratory and hope that the dark matter wind that's here all the time will come in and interact with our target and leave some imprint that we can somehow detect. And this is, for instance, an image of the Xenon 110 collaboration. And we also, uh, we also, of course, look via uh, telescopes and satellites where we look to the sky and we hope to see standard model annihilation or decay products of interactions of dark matter that are occurring uh, around us. And this is, for instance, an image uh, of the Fermi telescope. And so we've been searching for some time, and unfortunately, we haven't yet detected these particles. And this is true on all of these different frontiers. Our experiments are getting increasingly sensitive and doing a fabulous job at probing the WIMP, but we haven't yet detected dark matter. And so I view this moment in time as really an incredible opportunity for, uh, for new ideas to emerge. Because if you think about it, this WIMP mass range that we've been so focused on as a community for so long really spans just a small fraction out of a vast parameter space in which dark matter can reside. Dark matter could be many, 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 many orders of magnitude above or below the WIMP mass range. And so uh, what, I've, uh, what I want to talk about today is on the possibility of going lighter, in particular between 3 to 6 to even 12 orders of magnitude lighter, uh, which is sort of this new frontier of what we call light dark matter. And this has been a field of research that's been extremely active in recent years, um, both from the theory side and the experimental side. And what I hope to do is uh, sort of walk you together through, uh, through a sample of, how, um, uh, of how, uh, what's been going on, both from the theory and the experimental sides. So let's start with uh, theory. So uh, new theory ideas that predict light dark matter beneath the GV scale um, are actually extremely abundant. Um, so I've sort of put together over here uh, a very non-exhaustive laundry list, um, by no means a comprehensive list of uh, new ideas that have been put forward in recent years. And what I wanna do is sort of walk you through a few of these examples to give you a sense of how simple it is to get light dark matter. So here's my first example. And it's literally the WIMP. Okay, so let's still look at this two to two annihilation process, exactly what we had before. We still have the same parametrization of our cross section. We still have the exact same relationship between mass and coupling in order to account for our relic abundance. Except now, instead of taking this coupling to be of order and electroweak coupling, let's just take it to be significantly smaller. We naturally get light dark matter that is lighter than the WIMP. The second example is what I'll call forbidden channels. So we can still stay with this uh, two to two annihilation process, except now let's look at a kinematic regime where the sum of the incoming masses is smaller than the sum of the outgoing masses. Now, of course, at zero temperature, this process could not occur. It would be forbidden. But fortunately, our early universe is a thermal environment. And so in the early universe, this process can proceed by living off of the bolt and tail of the distributions of these dark matter particles. And so if we try to account for the relic abundance uh, of dark matter in this case, what you find is that the relationship between mass and coupling starts off looking very similar to the case of WIMP, except now there's an extra exponential suppression factor that's coming from this Boltzmann tail of the distribution. And so in this case, we naturally get dark matter that is exponentially lighter than the WIMP. My third example is uh, what if what's most important is not so much how much how dark matter is interacting with other stuff? What if what's important is how dark matter interacts with itself? So in this case, if we want to think of a process, uh, the first process that you can think of that's self-interactions of dark matter that's reducing the amount of dark matter in the early universe, that would be a three to two annihilation process where three dark matter particles come in and two dark matter particles shoot out. Okay, so these are three to two self-annihilations of dark matter. And if we parameterize this uh, sort of weird object of a three to two uh, annihilation cross section as some coupling squared over mass to the fifth, and in terms of dimensions, this is correct, then what you'd find is that in order to account for the dark matter abundance by this process, there has to be a very different relationship between the mass and the coupling. You'll now find that the mass of dark matter should go like this self coupling times a scale of order 100 MeV. And so here it happens to be the case that if this coupling is an order one coupling of order the strong coupling, now the strong scale emerges. And so instead of a weakly interacting massive particle, 
we now have a strongly interacting massive particle. Or instead of a WIMP, we now have a SIMP. This would be a dark matter candidate whose mass is predicted to be typically between the MEV and the GV mass range. Now, of course, if all that was really happening was just this three to two process uh, of self annihilations of dark matter, then this would be something that would pump heat into our system, right? Because three particles come in, the two dark matter particles that are shooting out are each more energetic than the incoming ones. And so there has to be some way to shed this heat. There has to be some way to dump entropy. And uh, this is easy to do, for instance, by, uh, uh, by having a, a thermalization process with light standard model species. And so we'd want this, uh, this uh, cooling process, this thermalization process to be active at the time of freeze out. And so in SIMP dark matter, uh, in this SIMP mechanism, we have these two knobs that are important in the story. We have on the one hand, uh, three to two self annihilation of dark matter. This is a process that's determining the relic abundance of dark matter. And it's the first process that decouples. And we have a second process, which is this uh, entropy dump process. Which allows us to um, which allows us to shed uh, to dump the entropy and to cool and in particular it decouples the second. But you could ask yourself what would happen if you reverse the order between these two processes. And in this case, you'd come uh, to find something very curious. And this is my fourth example. What you'd find is that in this case, your relic abundance of dark matter is now going to be exponentially sensitive to the size of this elastic scattering cross-section, a process that is not changing the number density of dark matter in the early universe. And so this is uh, called an elastically decoupling relic, or in short, an elder. And in fact, if you sort of um, think of the relative size between these two knobs, between uh, the size, the strength of the interaction between the dark matter and the standard model, compared to the uh, three to two self interactions of dark matter, then what you find is that actually, as you, uh, depending on the, on the relative size of these couplings, you actually flow in parameter space between a regime in which your dark matter would be a wimp-like to a regime where it would be simp-like to a regime in which it would be an elder. And so these three very distinct uh, mechanisms for dark matter are actually just different phases in the coupling parameter space. So I've given you a few examples of uh, different mechanisms that would predict uh, light dark matter. And in fact, these mechanisms are actually extremely generic when we want to think about theories, Lagrangians that we could write down that would realize them. So what do I mean by this? Now think of our beautiful visible sector, our standard model of particle physics, and it has an entire zoo of particles that come with a beautiful symmetry structure, um, our, SU our SU3 color cross SU3 cross U1 gauge symmetries. And you could ask yourself, why shouldn't the dark sector or couldn't the dark sector similarly have a lot of complexity to it, a lot of richness? Maybe it also has a whole new zoo of particles that perhaps are governed by new gauge symmetries. And so just taking inspiration from the standard model, you know, imagine just like we have a QCD, quantum chromodynamics, or SU3 gauge theory uh, of our visible sector, maybe there's some dark version of SU3. And in fact, it turns out it doesn't even have to be so standard model-like. It could be any SP gauge theory or SU gauge theory or SO gauge theory. And maybe just like in uh, the standard model in our uh, world that we already understand, we have U1 electromagnetism. Maybe there's some dark version of U1, uh, of U1 electromagnetism, a dark electromagnetism. And this would give us a dark photon that in principle could kinetically mix with the ordinary photon and enable these two sectors to talk to each other. And so these types of theories that I'm going to be talking about, these are really just theories of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking, just really QCD-like theories um, of strongly coupled gauge theories in which the pseudo number Goldstein bosons of the theories, which I'll collectively call the pions, can actually play the role of dark matter. And because these theories are so rich, they're just a really rich playground in which many mechanisms can emerge. So uh, to give you an example, let's maybe think of perhaps the most exotic uh, of the processes, exotic quote unquote, of the processes that, um, that we've already described. Think of these uh, three to two self annihilations of dark matter. Well, let's just think about QCD itself, okay? So QCD itself actually has five point interactions. We have two kaons that annihilates the three pions. And this is something that happens through a topological term in the Lagrangian that's called the West Omino Witten term. And in fact, if you take this term and you calculate the rate within the standard model, you'd find that it's just right to be a simp if the mass of the involved particles was of order a few hundred MeV. And so uh, inspired of this, inspired by this, uh, you can take any SP gauge theory or SU gauge theory or SO gauge theory. Um, in all of these theories, provided you have a sufficient number of flavors, three or two or more, depending on the particulars of the gauge group, 
Um, and all of these terms and all of these theories, the topological condition is met, the West Lomino Witten term exists. And as you see over here, it takes on a very particular form. Um, so, you know, it cares about the number of colors. Um, there's the pi on decay constant, which describes the theory, and it contracts five pi ions together in a very particular way. And so uh, we have two interactions, five point interactions uh, in this theory. And so what we get is that we actually, in all of these theories, generically have stable dark matter in the form of these dark pions that give us simp dark matter. The mass is pointed to be in this few hundred MeV range. And importantly, there is absolutely nothing exotic about this. This is just standard QCD-like theories. Of course, in theories like this, you can also think of doing um, three to two processes in other ways, such as using uh, glue balls. And there's been very interesting work um, in that direction as well. What about some of the two to two processes that we've um, that we've discussed? So uh, here's uh, uh, here are some uh, uh, some diagrams that can exist um, exist uh, examples of processes that um, just naturally happen in these um, in these theories. So all of the particles over here, unless they're denoted by standard model, these are all dark versions. So pi is a dark pion. Uh, rows are dark, uh, dark rows, um, et cetera. And so we, for instance, in these theories can have uh, forbidden annihilation channels uh, where two dark pions would annihilate into, uh, into dark rows. Um, we could have ordinary two to two annihilations either into uh, uh, dark photons or directly into standard model particles. Uh, we could have elastic scattering processes, which are important for SIMPs, but also could give us elder dark matter. Um, and we also can have semi-annihilations. And so there are many different processes, because of the richness of these theories, many different processes that, depending on the relative importance of them, different dark matter mechanisms can emerge. And so these, uh, these types of theories are actually not just, uh, it's not just that generically we can get so many different mechanisms of dark matter existing in them, but they're actually very predictive as well. So uh, for instance, if uh, we stick to this uh, dark electromagnetism example, um, then what I show you over here, I've sort of fixed my dark gauge group and uh, mass, of the, uh, mass of the dark matter. Um, and looking over here on the x-axis as a function of the dark photon mass. Um, and here on the y-axis is uh, the size of that kinetic mixing, which you can kind of think of as just the size of the coupling of this new vector to the electromagnetic current. And what you see over here is that just, um, you know, if we're along this curve over here in parameter space, we have elder dark matter. Up here, we have two to two annihilation, so it's kind of wimp-like. In this regime in the middle, we have simps. Down here, we're not thermalized. Over here, there's semi-annihilations. Just different regions of this parameter space realize different mechanisms. And there are, of course, many existing constraints on this parameter space. And those are shown over here, um, for instance, in the shaded gray regions, but also many future probes um, that one could hope to probe into this parameter space that are indicated by the, by the solid colored curves here, which come from you know, both high energy colliders, low energy colliders, fixed target experiments, beam dump experiments, direct detection, and more. And so there's uh, really many ways in which we could hope to probe this parameter space. But um, perhaps in this context, I find most exciting um, that we could actually hope to perform spectroscopy to measure the spectrum of the dark states themselves. So uh, what do I mean by this? So again, let's think about QCD. Okay, so how do we know this, the beautiful structure of the resonances of QCD that we've measured? Well, what we do is we smash electrons, positrons on each other, and that goes to all sorts of stuff, right, to all, this, uh, all these resonances. And basically by scanning the center of mass energy at which we're smashing the electron, positron pair on each other, we're tracing out that QCD resonance structure. And this leads to this beautiful picture, which um, you've likely seen before. You can ask yourself, how could I see the resonance structure if I had a fixed energy machine. And at a fixed energy machine, the answer is let's tack on a photon. Because if I measure uh, the energy of the photon, that's in one-to-one -one correspondence with the system that it recoiled against. Okay, And I don't have to be able to see the system it's recoiling against in order to be able to do this analogy. And so if we look at monophoton events at fixed, heart, at fixed energy experiments, then we can trace out the resonance structure of the invariant uh, of the system that it's recoiling against. And so, for instance, over here um, is an example of how one could see a simp-like spectrum um, at a, an experiment such as uh, Bell 2, okay, where you could, uh, where we could hopefully really be able to sort of see all of these um, dark resonances of uh, of the dark sector itself. And so, we could really hope to uh, perform spectroscopy in the dark sector. Okay, so uh, that's kind of what I wanted to tell you guys about in the context of pure theory. Um, and if I've lost any of you, this is a great point to, um, to jump back because I'm kind of going to switch gears and we're going to start talking about 
how we can hope to detect it through experiments that we would build um, with targets in our laboratory. So we uh, have many experiments that are already running, um, searching for dark matter in the laboratory. And although they, of course, uh, all have their own uh, unique, uh, unique methods and unique um, properties, they roughly follow a similar set of blueprints. And so the idea is that we have some target that's sitting in our lab, typically deep underground. Um, and the hope is that the dark matter particles that are here all the time um, are going to come in. It's going to hit that target in the lab. There's going to be some reaction of the system. And we're going to hope to measure that reaction. OK, so dark matter comes in, hits my target. The target gets excited. You know, maybe it's going to shoot out an electron or a photon or a phonon or something is going to happen. And we're going to measure what is that something. And so here is a typical plot that you've likely seen from dark matter uh, direct detection experiments, which shows us currently, because we haven't detected dark matter, the size of the constraints that they're able to place on the dark matter parameter space. So as a function of the dark matter mass, what is the constraint that they can place on the interaction cross-section between dark matter and uh, nuclei? And so all of these uh, colored, colored curves are showing uh, results from different experiments. And what you can kind of see common to all of these curves in this region over here is that they're all sort of shooting up over here. Okay, so what's going on in this region? Why are these experiments losing sensitivity when the mass of dark matter drops beneath this few GV range? So uh, the answer is what these current experiments are typically doing is looking for nuclear recoil signals. Now, the energy in a nuclear recoil event um, goes like the momentum transfer squared over twice the target mass. Momentum transfer ballpark of mass of dark matter times its velocity, velocity in units of uh, speed of light 10 to the minus 3. And if we're going to detect this nuclear recoil, then of course this energy better be above our experimental thresholds, which are typically of order keV. But you can actually understand everything that's going on just in terms of thinking of billiard balls. Okay, so if I'm a heavy dark matter particle, like a WIMP, which is what these experiments were designed to detect, then this makes total sense. Big, you can kind of think of this heavy dark matter as like a big ball. Okay, so a big ball comes into the lab, hits another big ball, my heavy nuclei, and it can give it a kick, and we're going to measure that kick. It makes perfect sense. But what if the dark matter is much lighter? Well, in this case, the kinematics is more like a tiny little ping pong ball that's trying to give a big kick to a big bowling ball. Okay, it's just not going to work. This light dark matter can't give a big enough punch to kick that heavy nuclei. And this is why these experiments lose sensitivity when the mass of the dark matter drops beneath the GV scale. And so if we want to be sensitive to light dark matter, then it's much smarter to scatter off of something lighter, such as electrons, where the kinematics is more well matched, and this light dark matter can give a big enough punch to these electrons. And this basic understanding, based on just billiard ball analysis, really sits at the foundation of many of the new ideas that have been proposed in the literature in recent times. And so to sort of uh, understand that, um, let me provide you with the following energy guideline. So if we want to think of a dark matter scattering event, um, then when dark matter scatters with electrons, you know, the maximum energy that it could possibly deposit into the system is the entire kinetic energy that it's carrying. Okay? Kinetic energy goes like mass times velocity squared, which means 10 to the minus 6 times its mass in natural units. And that means that if we want to build systems that are sensitive to the GV mass scale through scattering processes, then we need systems that are sensitive to KV energy deposits. And this is exactly the case of uh, the experiments that were designed for the WIMPs. But if we want to go lighter by three orders of magnitude and probe dark matter at the MEV scale, then we need systems that are sensitive to much smaller energy deposits of order EVs. And if we want to be really greedy and go all the way down to the warm dark matter limit at a KV, then we need systems that are sensitive to really tiny energy deposits of order milli electron volts. And we can organize all of the existing ideas in the literature um, based on sort of the size of the energy deposit that they're sensitive to. OK, so um, I've uh, put together um, a whole bunch of them over here. Um, and as you see, some of them involve uh, interactions with electrons the way that we, um, as we discussed. Some actually involve also interactions with nuclei in sort of a smart way where they're taking advantage of, um, of phonon modes. But there's really just been this explosion of interest and ideas in recent times. And of course, we're not going to be able to walk through all of these ideas together. But what I'm going to do is, again, uh, sort of choose a few examples to, um, to give you a sense of the types of materials, the types of detection philosophies, and the types of, um, uh, of processes that people have been sort of thinking about to hopefully open your mind in this direction. So uh, let's start with example number one. And these are actually the first ideas that were put forward in this context probably around a decade ago. 
Um, and so the thought had been, well, maybe dark matter would come in and ionize an atom, okay? Or maybe dark matter would, um, would come in uh, and hit a semiconductor and uh, deposit enough energy to promote an electron from the valence band up to the conduction band. And so if we want to think of the energy scales for atomic ionization, say uh, a typical atom, let's say xenon, uh, uh, ionization energy of order 10 eV, um, semiconductors, you know, for typical semiconductors like germanium or silicon, and we've recently been able to show that even diamond and silicon carbide are great for this context. Um, the band gap is of order eV or a few eV. And so based on that energy guideline that we discussed, this tells us that these systems could hope to probe dark matter down to the MeV scale. And while these ideas were originally put forward uh, primarily by theorists, they are actually being experimentally realized these days, which is really amazing. Um, and so on the atomic ionization um, front, uh, xenon, uh, the xenon uh, materials and xenon collaborations have really been leading the charge. Um, and on the semiconductor front, there's both super CDMS and Sensei, which uh, have very distinct silicon devices, um, which are really already placing incredible new limits into unprobed um, dark matter masses uh, parameter space um, in the sub GV range. So this is really great. Um, but what happens if we want to go to these smaller masses? This is something that we fundamentally can't do in these systems through the electronic excitations. So if we want to go to smaller masses, in comes example number two, which are superconductors. So uh, in superconductors, the ground state of the system is no longer free electrons, but it's energetically favorable for them to sort of follow the buddy system. And so they pair up in pairs that are called Cooper pairs. And the binding energy of these pairs, which is the same as the gap of the system, is of order milli electron volts. And so based on this energy guideline, this tells us that we could hope to probe dark matter down to the KV masses using superconductors. So the idea would be that dark matter is going to come in it's going to scatter with these Cooper pairs, deposit enough energy to break those Cooper pairs apart. That's going to create some excitations in the system that we can hope to detect. And when we first put forward this idea um, over five years ago, um, we used a philosophy that's very similar to what super CDMS do, um, which is this excitation concentration philosophy, where you sort of think of a big, uh, a big bulk superconductor um, in which you kind of uh, let, let the, the excitation sort of ricochet around, uh, sort of random walk around until you collect and detect them. But uh, what I'll be mentioning today is a, a more recent um, philosophy that we've developed, which is the sensor and target philosophy. So for this, uh, the technology of choice that we've uh, worked out is, uh, uh, um, it has a very long name. It's called a superconducting nanowire single photon detector, or in short, it's called SNSPDs. And this is a technology that was developed for a completely different field of research. Okay, it's a, a, it's a mature technology that was a, a, it's broadly used in quantum information science and quantum sensing. And so here the idea is that um, dark matter can come in. Um, so this uh, sort of this nanowire is sitting in a self-biased, uh, uh, again, in a sort of uh, in a biased circuit close to some critical value of a current. And the idea would be the dark matter would come in, um, ram an electron in this nanowire, uh, that's going to create some hotspot in the nanowire. The electrons are now sort of going to diffuse away. There's going to be a resistive region across this nanowire that's going to result in a voltage pulse that we can read. And essentially what we've proposed is just to take this extremely mature technology and apply it for the first time towards the dark matter hunt. And so we propose that this, these little nanowires could simultaneously be the target with which dark matter is interacting as well as simultaneously the sensitive sensor that's sensing that this interaction has even occurred. And of course, if we were to hope to one day build up in, uh, in target mass, we would hope to multiplex many of these. And we actually already have a, a tiny little existing prototype device that's already been, pr been uh, providing us with science results. And I'll show you those results um, a little later today, um, but it really serves sort of as a proof of concept for the immense power of this, uh, of this idea. Um, now, what about directional information? So um, if you sort of think of this, uh, of what super CDMS do and uh, what I mentioned in our first uh, initial proposal using bulk superconductors, if what's happening is that dark matter comes in and there's sort of excitations that ricochet around and we're detecting these secondary particles, um, we're kind of losing any directional information about where the initial dark matter particle was coming from. Um, we've, we've recently been able to show how perhaps in bulk superconductors, we could actually retain this directionality um, but at least at face value, it's, uh, there's some directionality that might be lost. And we can hope to retain this directional information if uh, instead of observing the secondaries, we observe primary particles. 
And you know, directional information has long been recognized as a very powerful tool in our search for dark matter because it enables us, it gives us a daily modulation of our signal rate. It really enables to separate signal from background. And so we could hope to retain this directional information if we observe the primary particle with which we interacted. And so this is something we can hope to do, for instance, with two-dimensional targets. Uh, and I'll tell you the story in the context of graphene, but keep in mind that something very similar could actually be done with these nanowires as well. So that's my third example, uh, graphene. So um, you know, graphene is a wonderful two-dimensional target with a vanishing or nearly vanishing band gap. And I'm actually not going to use any of the beautiful properties of graphene. All we have to know is that in order to eject an electron from this material, we have to overcome the binding energy, which is nearly nothing, plus the work function, okay, which is of order a few electron volts. And so uh, based on our energy guideline, this tells us that we could hope to be sensitive to dark matter at the MeV scale with these materials. And so the idea would be the dark matter is going to come in, it's going to scatter with the valence electrons, deposit enough energy now to eject an electron from the material, and we're going to detect that electron that was ejected. Okay, so this is an eject and detect philosophy. And the real strength of this proposal comes from the fact that if you look at the direction of that ejected electron, it turns out that it tracks the direction of the incoming dark matter particle. Okay, and so what this does is it naturally gives us a forward backward discrimination power, a way to separate our signal from background. So you know, imagine here's my graphing sheet. Okay, and imagine at a certain point during the day, the dark matter wind is coming exactly from below. And now my electron, which is ejected in the forward direction, is ejected over here, and we detect it. But now fast forward 12 hours later, as Earth is rotated around its axis, now the relative orientation is, here's my graphing sheet, here's my dark matter wind, that eject that electron that's ejected in the forward direction is now being ejected into the substrate. And so it's either not detected or detected as something different. And so this setup naturally gives us a way to have this forward backward discrimination power or head tail discrimination power which would be so important were we ever to see something and want to be able to claim this is really a dark matter signal. And so imagine we want that we'd want to have you know, a large chunk of graphene to build a big experiment, so let's say half a kilogram of graphene. Um, we'd roughly need around billions of centimeter square crystals of graphene, okay? So uh, I did the computation. It roughly would mean I'd have to tile the entire area of the old city of Jerusalem to do this. And under the assumption that uh, nobody in their right mind is gonna let me do this, um, the way that we would hope to sort of build up to this, um, to this large, uh, large quantity is really by using a compact geometry where we have many, many stacks. And so for the, for the amount that, we're, uh, that we sort of have in mind, uh, it's something that we uh, believe can fit into roughly a 10 meter cubed uh, volume. And you might think that it sounds totally crazy to think you could ever have that much graphene until you find out that there is an experiment that plans to do just that. So there's a proposed experiment called Ptolemy, um, which was originally proposed as an experiment to detect relic neutrinos through their cathodron tritium. And it turns out that they intended to have their tritium sitting on around half a kilogram of graphene. And so essentially what we proposed is that we could borrow the uh, sort of the bare graphene sheets before they loaded with tritium uh, and run this as a dark matter experiment. And this idea has now been officially adopted by the, by the Ptolemy collaboration, um, of which I'm now also officially a member. And so you see Ptolemy is now officially also a, this is a title from uh, one of our recent papers on the archive. Um, it's also officially an experiment for directional detection of MEV dark matter. And for me as a theorist, it's certainly super interesting to see sort of the inside works of how um, an experimental collaboration um, moves forward. Okay, so I've given you a few examples of different materials, um, a different different detection philosophies um, for detecting light dark matter. But of course, anytime somebody tells you they have some new material, you have to go ahead and compute what is the rate? How many events would I expect to see in a given exposure? And uh, the event rate um, has a few different factors that of course come in. So of course you care about, uh, there's a piece that cares about the target density. There's a piece that cares about sort of the dark matter flux that's coming in. Um, a big piece that cares about the properties of the target, and this is where very often, uh, you know, condensed matter physics, for instance, will come in. And of course, uh, the particle physics kind of sits in that's the strength of the interaction uh, with the material. And so uh, you can go ahead for any material and compute what is the rate, and from that understand what is your reach that you would project if you were to construct such an experiment. And so here is uh, an example of a plot that we put together, uh, sort of the, um, the expected reach of many of the different proposals um, that we put together in a community report a few years ago. 
Um, and so what you see over here uh, on the x-axis is dark matter mass, note now in units of MeV. Um, and over here on the y-axis, we're showing the, uh, the cross-section of the interaction with dark matter and electrons now. And this is um, a reference cross-section, um, in particular, assuming a light mediator with some particular uh, reference momentum, as is, um, uh, as is typical in the field. But um, what you see over here in all of these different colored curves are the different projected reach into this parameter space by many of the existing um, uh, proposals. And so let's take a look, um, for example, let's start with all of these that are sort of sitting up over here, all of these different ideas that are um, uh, losing sensitivity at the MeV scale that can probe down to the MeV scale. These are all of the ideas that have roughly EV gaps of energy, okay? And uh, amongst them, I'll just note um, this green dashed one, which is the graphene proposal. Um, and so you see that compared to others of a, of a similar um, energy gap, it does better than some, worse than others, um, but it's roughly sort of in the same ballpark. Importantly, out of all those that are shown over here, it's the only one that has this directional detection capability, which if we were to see a signal would be so important in order to be able to claim a discovery. And down here in this dotted green is the reach of superconducting targets, which you see that if we could construct these experiments on large scales would have absolutely amazing reach. And just to show you that this isn't science fiction, um, as I mentioned before, we already have an existing prototype device um, that's been giving us uh, results. And so we have this uh, tiny little uh, SNSPD, tiny little nanowire that's made of tungsten silicide. Um, it's really small. It's just around four nanograms of material. Um, we know that it had at least 0.8 EV threshold, possibly lower, but this is what we can say for sure. Um, and at the time that we put out our first PRL, we had observed it for roughly three hours and seen no dark, no dark counts. Um, by now, we actually have significantly more data, um, which we've just released to the archive a, a while back, um, around 180 hours of data. And so here's what we're able to do with this uh, very small amount of data from this tiny little device. Um, so again, showing you over here as a function of the dark matter mass, um, what we, uh, the size of the constraint on the interaction cross-section with electrons. So in shaded gray are all the existing terrestrial constraints from all these very large scale um, experiments. And the shaded blue region up here is showing you um, the bound that we're able to place on this parameter space by using this tiny little nanowire. Okay, and so uh, importantly, we're already, thanks to, this, uh, thanks to the, uh, this very low threshold, we're already able to break new ground in dark matter parameter space. And the various uh, colored curves over here are showing you as we were to go to larger arrays uh, while pushing thresholds lower and keeping dark counts low, um, the incredible reach that these superconducting nanowire targets could hope to have into, uh, into dark matter parameter space. And the difference over here between the solid curves and the dashed or the dotted curves um, is actually uh, uh, the, the solid curves are showing what would happen for sort of if you treat the, this material as these detectors as bulk devices um, compared to very interesting uh, thin layer effects that we now understand how, um, uh, how to incorporate and we actually believe should be able to give us additional geometric enhancements to these rates. And so uh, very possibly uh, the reach could be substantially better. And importantly, uh, it's very important, I'm not trying to advocate for any particular technology, but just to show how with moderate improvements to existing technology, um, uh, sensitivity to, you know, to the 10 keV or to the keV mass scale of dark matter could really be possible. And in fact, we're nowhere near the fundamental limits of these devices. So my um, quantum sensing expert uh, collaborators uh, who I've been working with on these nanowires have actually recently um, developed and demonstrated a similar nanowire, um, which actually had a significantly lighter, uh, lighter threshold. So they were able to show that it's sensitive to the 10 micron wavelength. So in particle physics unit, this is 125 millivolt energy threshold. Okay, so if we look back at this, um, at this reach curve, at these reach plots over here, that sort of corresponds to you know, the threshold of this green curve. Okay, and so, uh, and it's actually very possible that even uh, our existing prototype device is sensitive to, um, uh, to lower thresholds than, uh, than we're aware of, but you see that thresholds of this type are already being demonstrated. And so there's really so much hope that we could um, push to much lower thresholds um, while constructing larger arrays and really hope to, to reach new uncharted regions of uh, parameter space. Now, we've also been able to uh, recently understand um, a new formalism for how to compute the rate of how dark matter interacts with any given material. Because uh, it turns out that the way that dark matter interacts with the material is completely determined by material properties. And in particular, it's determined by the dielectric function or by the loss function. 
And this is true for any dark matter interaction that cares uh, about coupling to electron density. So any spin independent interaction. So it could be a scalar mediator or a vector mediator. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that there's some weak probe into the system. And importantly, this dielectric function, which determines everything, is a quantity that one can measure. And so um, uh, sort of the strength of this, uh, this approach really lies in the fact that historically the way that um, the community has been computing these rates throughout the literature is by using the uh, sort of the single particle excitation language. And that completely misses out on uh, sort of the collective, the collective effect that can be very important. And so this new formalism automatically includes all of the many body effects of the material, um, which could be extremely important for understanding what is the prospect of a material, what is the reach that it could really, um, that it could really place into dark matter parameter space. And it also, moreover, gives us the ability to, um, by understanding where these collective modes are sitting, um, to identify promising new materials that could uh, really be even optimal for dark matter detection. So this, uh, uh, for instance, uh, there's a completely new type of, type of uh, materials that we've been able to identify, uh, not that the materials are new, but their identification is excellent. Um, dark matter detector prospects is uh, is what's new, and these are heavy fermion systems. So, uh, for instance, over here, this is uh, this curve shown over here in green. Um, just because of sort of where the collective modes of these materials are sitting, uh, we're able to understand that these are excellent systems for uh, for dark that have excellent prospects for dark matter detection. And I really think that this new formalism is going to give us a new tool with which we can hopefully identify quantify and, um, uh, and compute um, optimal materials for dark matter detection. Now, finally, um, I want to point out that anytime somebody tells you they have some new target material for dark matter detection, they can actually go even further. So uh, let's think back for a moment at this energy guideline we discussed earlier. And we talked about the dark matter scattering in which uh, the, uh, the maximum energy that could be deposited was the kinetic energy of the particle. But there's another process that could also be happening, and that is rather than dark matter scattering with the target, dark matter being absorbed by the target. So what I mean is that dark matter comes in, I don't care what comes out, but no dark matter is coming out, okay? And in this case, the energy deposit into the system is actually the entire mass energy of the dark matter. And what that means is that if I have some system that somebody's designed that is sensitive to KV energy deposits, then it's true that through scattering processes, it's sensitive to GV dark matter masses. It's simultaneously through absorption processes sensitive to the KV mass scale. Similarly, EV energy deposits also sensitive to EV masses and milli EV deposits also sensitive to milli EV masses. And so if you construct an experiment that's sensitive to a particular energy deposit, you're actually getting two mass ranges of dark matter for the price of one. And so that means that uh, just like we can uh, place limits and, uh, and projection uh, projected reach on dark matter scattering parameter space, we can similarly for any material uh, understand what is the reach into absorption of dark matter. And so uh, here's an example. Imagine that now dark matter is some relic uh, dark photon. Then you see as a function of the dark photon mass now in EV units, uh, we can understand what are the size of the constraints or the projections on the size of that kinetic mixing, the size with which this new vector couples to the electromagnetic current. And so again, shaded gray show all of the existing terrestrial constraints. Um, over here in blue, you see this, uh, the new bound that we're able to place with this tiny little nanowire, again, breaking new ground, the strongest terrestrial constraints to date on these sub EV masses of a dark photon dark matter. And all of these uh, colored curves over here, which might look a little wacky, but these are just examples of all of the materials that people have proposed in the literature, showing that if we could construct these experiments, that even on this parameter space, we could really hope to probe incredible new ground. OK, so um, hopefully I've uh, convinced you that uh, light dark matter is a very active field of research. And this is true both from the theory side and the experimental side. There are so many new ideas that are emerging. And of course, as one uh, makes progress in one, in one direction, uh, that sort of feeds into the progress into the other. And importantly, I want to stress that I think the ideas are by no means exhausted. Um, I really think we're just at the beginning of understanding what are good materials for dark matter that we could be using. And if there's anything that I've learned over the last few years thinking about this topic, is that it is absolutely fine. It is perfectly okay for an idea to seem totally crazy at first, because it might just be that your crazy theory idea turns out to be completely generic in some class of theories that you never even thought of before or never even realized um, admit this behavior. 
or it might just turn out that your crazy idea for some new uh, new technology is actually you know that there's some some person some scientist in a completely different field of research who just has a tiny little device sitting in their laboratory that they've never thought to apply towards dark matter and it could be placing the most uh, you know the strongest constraints to date if used and so um, it's totally fine for ideas to seem crazy at first and I really think that our best ideas might still be ahead and I'll say that for me as a, uh, what I consider sort of a young scientist in the field, I find it particularly inspiring that if I think of where we were as a um, uh, sort of in the particle physics community in the context of dark matter searches just a decade ago, we had an incredible, uh, incredible program searching for the WIMPs. And this program is gonna continue to run in full steam in upcoming years and do an amazing job at searching above the GED scale. But if dark matter was lighter than that, we just didn't have many good ideas. I'm just thinking of the incredible um, uh, amount of diversity that we're seeing in uh, of ideas coming up uh, for this sub GV uh, region in recent times. I just think it's it's absolutely incredible, and um, you know even though often it's a uh, uh, theorists who are thinking of these uh, thinking of these uh, ideas, um, we're really working in close collaboration with experimentalists who are really taking these ideas and making them a reality, really bringing them to life. And this is actually not something that's just sitting sort of at the interface between uh, um, you know, a high energy theory and high energy experiment. It's really something that interfaces all aspects of particle physics with you know, condensed matter physics, material science, quantum sensing, precision measurements. Um, and so uh, it's really something that I think uh, uh, all of these different fields of research, um, uh, when they come together, I think that incredible science uh, can, really, can really emerge from that. And I'll just end by saying that if you have any crazy new ideas, you're very welcome to be in touch. And I'll thank you for your time. Thanks for a very nice and clear talk. Um, so I think we have time for some questions. Uh, George, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in your idea that there might be some kind of um, dark version of QCD in the dark sector, uh, in normal QCD, the strong CP angle is zero for no reason that we understand. Uh, so presumably in the dark sector, uh, that zero would not, that angle would not be zero, but it would be an order one number. Um, how would that uh, affect the phenomenology of uh, dark matter if you have that strong, dark, strong CP angle? Have yeah, that's a great that? question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's actually something, a, a, a project that we've had sort of on the back burner for a while. Um, we, we call it CP sims. Um, and it's absolutely true. There's no, you know, I, I, so I can have a theta angle, right? A CP, I can have a CP violating angle there. Um, and this actually now gives you another way in which you can have five point interaction. So another contribution. Um, and we do think that it's gonna be able to broaden the range of dark matter masses of these dark pions um, and potentially also with very interesting phenomenology. So it's, it's, you know, we're really, as I said, we're really only at the beginning of, you know, of understanding even just in these, you know, th this is by no means the only way in which one can construct SIMPs, but certainly a very broad category of, you know, class of theories. Um, and in them, yeah, there's absolutely, you can start thinking about what happens when I throw in CP and, and I think it's gonna have interesting, um, interesting ramifications. Great, thanks. Sure. Dave, Dave Moore. Yeah, so thanks Uni for a really excellent talk. So I guess I had a question about, you mentioned directionality with the nanowire detectors. Um, and I guess they're almost 2D, but not quite 2D and have some finite thickness compared to the distance electrons or nuclei recoil. Can you comment a little more about how that works? Yeah, so I think that the directionality that I that I at least can say that I'm fairly confident happens, um, there might be another way to do it in a different energy range. But if I think about not using the nanowires for, um, you know, for, for, for going very, very low in the energies, which is really where most of their strength sits, um, if I just think of them as something that, again, it's a material, and I think of what's my work function, it's again EV, because EV, you know, EV, there's nothing special about graphene in that sense. This is really just, you know, very often that's what the work function is. And so if I think of sort of EV deposits, then I could have, then I could eject electrons. And then again, if I have some sort of array, a stacked array of these nanowires, then in principle, um, very similar to, you know, whether the stacked array is the graphene sheets or is the nanowires, 
um, you could hope to have a similar sort of to construct a similar story of, um, of directionality. That's a way in which you could do directionality, which doesn't use a lot of the power of the nanowires. And to, if you wanted to go to the lower energies, that's something that is not, it's not yet clear. I think there might be a way to do it, but it's, 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 uh, you know, it is still to be, um, to be thought of in more, um, in more depth. Other questions? Um, I'll, I'll ask a quick one. Um, how, uh, for some of these, you know, very light dark matter models that you're probing, um, how, how sensitive is the direct detection to the form of the dark matter velocity distribution? Is that sort of an important um, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's very, so if, assuming I'm still talking about, you know, that the sort of ballpark is 10 to the minus three, I think it's not extremely sensitive to what I'm going to assume about, you know, typically when these plots are done, one tries to sort of conform to be comparing apples to apples. So one takes a standard halo model, you know, with, it isn't, isn't even exactly like agreement what sort of, uh, you're not, it's never really apples to apples because people are taking slightly different values, but as a rough estimate, it is it is correct you know and in the end of the day um there are going to be much more important factors that are really going to determine what is your you know what it, what exactly um is your reach things do start looking very different if you start if you were to say well i don't want to talk about you know like the dominant a dominant component of dark matter that's that's sort of with the standard um, velocity distribution what if i want to think of do i have some boosted component or do I have a very slow component because the size of that velocity, the order of magnitude does play a role when you think of kinematics, you know, when is a material um, better or worse, certainly, um, certainly cares about that. So I think that's, that's a much bigger, um, a much bigger difference between, um, between the projections. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any more questions? All right, if not, why don't we thank you need again for a really nice talk? Thanks everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks guys. Enjoy the rest All of right. your day. Thanks, have a good night. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye, take care. Bye.